lately I've been studying how habits affect productivity and how that can help you uh, work less and have more fun. Today on the show, I've got one of my dearest friends, Hazel Thornton. Um, we've known each other like, geez, almost 20 years, <laughs> somewhere between 15 and 20 years. Um, and uh, she's an organizer as well. But her slant on it these days is all about genealogy and organizing photos. And so I'm super excited to have her on the show. A little more about Hazel is she actually, she's an author as well. So she's written a few books, some on topic and one not at all on topic. And yet it's fascinating. And um, so check out Hazel's stuff. The new book that she's working on now is a collection of her clutter flow charts. It's decision making. It's kind of um, like the, you Post them while you're organizing so that you know what the next step is. For those of you that really like to have checklists and steps for um, the process. And she is in Albuquerque along with me. So it's kind of funny. She lives one mile away, almost exactly, <laughs> which I find hilarious. Um, and now she's combining those genealogy research skills with her organizing skills and um the book we're going to be talking about mostly today because it's a very cool approach is called what's a photo without a story how to create your family like Le legacy and lately I, I feel like especially during the pandemic i got a lot of clients that were asking about downsizing and creating legacy like they finally had the time to actually do all the stuff they put off forever so i'm excited about this conversation but Everyone, please welcome Hazel Thornton. And hi, Hazel. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm excited that we're finally doing this. I know. We've had a couple of glitches and had to reschedule. And um, I'm I'm really excited that we were able to, to pull it off and make it happen finally. So fantastic. So the first thing I want to do is uh, you know, let's just get some of the basic questions out of the way and then we can see where the conversation goes. But what what makes this particular book different than regular genealogy books or photo organizing books? It's a nice combo, in my opinion. Well, <laughs> yeah, I like to say that I live at the intersection of genealogy and organizing. Um, <clears throat> because there aren't a lot of books about both. <laughs> and yeah. and what, I, what I found is that a lot of people uh, want to tell their stories, but they just don't know how to go about it. Mm -hmm. And... What makes this different is that a most photo organizing and genealogy books, or many of them, have a, a set process. You go, you know, follow this step and this step and this step, and you will get this. Right. But it's not. There, there are very few people who are going to want that result. There, there's so many yeah. different goals to what you might want from your photos and your mm -hmm. and your. Uh, telling your story. And so I present it to you as, you know, how much effort do you want to put into it? Low effort, medium effort, high effort. And depending on your goals, you don't have to do it at your pace and, and reach your goals at your level of wherewithal. I love that. And um, we, we need to take a quick break. But when we come back, I totally want to get into that piece about different people have different goals and you can't approach it the same because that's what this show is all about. Um, so we've got to take a quick break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlination on Bold Brave TV network. And after the break, Hazel and I will be talking about how to figure out what your actual desired outcome is for your legacy project. All right, we'll be right back. The free one minute mail solution works for email too, and you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a the link. Hello and welcome back to the Streamlined Connection. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Bold Brave TV network and I'm here speaking with Hazel Thornton of Organized for Life and Beyond. I just love that you've added that to your <laughs> your business. Um, and we are talking about how to leave a family legacy um, and talking about how many uh, organizing books or articles approach it with a very by step process, but that only leads to one desired outcome. So 
is there a way you help people figure out what their actual desired outcome is to start or do you just go let them figure it out? Oh no, if they, if they, I mean, they often come to me with an idea in mind already. Yeah. And, but, but if they're not sure, then it kind of depends on whether they're a genealogist or not, because ah. if they, if they aren't and they have no desire to be, um, they might want me to help them um, by doing some genealogy research for them, but they don't, it doesn't have to involve genealogy, the telling the stories of your photos. Right. All you have to do is pick a photo and say, you know what, I know what's going on in this photo, but I'll bet my family doesn't know what's going on in this photo. Mm -hmm. If I just jot a few notes down, then, then they'll know. And, yeah. and, and, and the, their goals could be, I want to leave photos with sticky notes on the back with the bare minimum, or I want to write a book about my family and mm -hmm. everywhere in between. Right. And, and so if they, but if they don't tell the stories of their photos, they're going to be leaving their family thousands of photos because mm -hmm. we take photos every day now than we, than our ancestors did in their entire lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And, and if they, if, if all the photos are special, then none of the photos are special. And if they, if yeah. they only just pick this, the ones that they know the stories of that are interesting, then their family can, um, they can share them with their family. Uh, mm -hmm. They can appreciate them. They can leave them a select number of them to appreciate as opposed to a whole pile of clutter. Yeah, I'm in the middle of helping my mom with some of the family photos and my great grandmother actually made this beautiful album of a trip she took through the South in 1927, I think. And it's gorgeous. And it has all these stories about the places she visited. Not one picture picture of the people that went with her or her in the entire album. And it was like, okay, this is fascinating, but it's not really helping with our family history in any way. And so it was like, do we need to keep this one? Like it was cool well, that she had done it, but at the same time, yeah, we captured a few key flip, dates. But other and, than that. And the flip side of people who aren't into genealogy are those who are into genealogy. And yeah. that's they can't get their family interested in their names and their dates and their pedigree charts and their, right. and so, and so I like to encourage them to add photos. Mm -hmm. And if they have, if they can match up family photos with names and dates on a pedigree chart, that makes right. the genealogy so much more interesting to their families. And yeah. if they don't have very many photos, there are ways to find photos. Yeah. And you know, we have, it's just the one with the good story. Isn't the photo, isn't, those. <laughs> so now I'm realizing I should have saved it for you to, to look at, but we decided to actually let that album go after we captured a few of the <laughs> things. But I found it hilarious because it was a beautiful album. It was, you know, all you written in silver <laughs> on the black pages. And you then it was like some of it go, you're going to end up with the 36 I have in my garage from my mom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we basically started with that. We're down to four file drawers that we still have to go through. But uh, yeah, but there's a lot people and, and it's, but story is such a fabulous way to approach it. Like if you start thinking about what story do I want to tell about my family or what, you know, you can start with that framework of, of some dates and a few key activities, but well, and, and what do you want to flip about it? And people who aren't writers, they're like, well, I'm not a writer. All, all you have to do is go back to the old journalism, who, what, mm -hmm. when, why, and where. Right. And if you just answer those questions, you've got a story. I love that. Yeah, because if you don't know those details, it just becomes a photo of someone. And if you don't know every single <laughs> detail, if you write down the ones you do know, maybe somebody else can for you. Oh, it, it totally fills in. That's the other thing that's so fun as we're looking through things. And I know it happened to you when you were doing your mom stuff that you, you know, four boxes over, you find the thing that tells you when that was. Or, oh, here's the train ticket for the trip through the South, you know, and then you have a little bit more idea. Um, cool. So why do you think it's so important to tell stories? I think it, I think it makes us feel connected. I think mm. a lot of people feel disconnected these days and that really helps. Um, I think it helps make history come alive. I was never 
particularly interested in history until I started researching my family in different periods of time. Right. It really, really made it come alive for me. So that's the research part, but then adding the photos to it makes it more interesting to my family. Um, yeah. And, and it gives depth and meaning to photos to add details and stories. And it also makes pedigree charts more interesting to add the photos to the details. Yeah, I think it really does. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, just as an exa another example, my grandma, uh, turns out she was a band groupie in the late 30s, early 40s. <laughs> and um, she would meet her friends from uh, teacher's college and they would travel around the Midwest and uh, go see bands on the weekends. And well, it's so funny. It's like a thing then. <laughs> I know, I kind of, well, I knew she had sung in a band because her brother had a band that played a lot in Chicago, but I didn't realize she had hopped train and gone to other cities to watch other bands That's until we went through her, her letters. And so that was really interesting to find out. And it explained a few of the photos that were like, I didn't know she traveled so much. Where is that? That doesn't That's look cool. familiar. So, um, yeah, That's that was pretty story. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I got to actually finish jotting it all down, but, um, we're, we're starting to put it together. So, um, so what, what, um, we, we're got to take another break, but when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about how to take those stories into, um, you know, how to tell the difference between just genealogical fact and 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 a story that's historical. Um, and that brings up a point about just how important is your family stuff. <laughs> and so we'll touch on that a little bit when we come to Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And we'll be right back. The Streamline Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The link's around here somewhere. Welcome back. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And Hazel Thornton, organized for life and beyond, is my guest today. And we're talking about genealogy and family history and how to create a legacy with your photos and, and perhaps some items that you have. Um, but we were leaving off with, with how to pick those details like that make history, make the gene, the historical aspects that bring the genealogy alive. Do you have any tips for connecting the item to the historical relevance or, or well, sure. one, part one of the story? Thing. One thing to uh, to do, I mean, there's a lot of things to do. If you're doing your own research, you can, or if I'm doing it for you, you can um, find uh, stories that other people have written and you can find uh, historical documents that then trigger, it's, it's, they trigger questions and then you do research to follow up on it. For example, mm. my grandma on my mom's side, I knew she died in 1918. And actually, I knew she died of the Spanish flu. But oh my goodness, during COVID, you know, I did so much more research on the Spanish flu and mm -hmm. how it affected people her age. It wasn't the young, it wasn't the old. It was the, you know, mm -hmm. it was like people in their 30s who who were dying of the Spanish flu. And uh, so it makes it makes that kind of if you, so if you know that somebody died for example, in a place and a time, you can do some research to see, well, what else was going on at that time? And what, why, you know, what, if somebody did in a war, well, which war was it? And how did it affect the family? And what kind of pension did the widow get? Mm -hmm. any? Um, and, and so that the way you do, the way you flesh it out is by doing research. Yeah, that's the fun part for both of us, I think. <laughs> and, not, and not so much for others. And, yeah. and, the, and the, the reason I uh, I talk about, sometimes I talk about genealogy as opposed to family history, mm -hmm. is that um, I use the terms kind of interchangeably, but I, I but if I'm being really specific, genealogy would be the, the research part of it. Mm -hmm. And family history, people who say, people who think, well, I'm not interested in genealogy, in doing research. Family history is still important because 
you may have photos that nobody else has. You may have, mm -hmm. you know, heirlooms or even just keepsakes that nobody else has. And if you don't tell the stories or leave or, or, or at least tell somebody this is important, then they won't know. You don't have to do any genealogy research to be a, a, um, a, a steward of family history items mm -hmm. and stories. And if you don't tell the stories, who will? Right. right. Um, and just before the break, or actually during the break, we were chatting about how different aspects can be important to people. So I've always thought of genealogy as a little more the the technical things, the actual who's related to who versus the family history, which is the stories and, and putting it into social context and such. But more and more, we have to be aware of the biases in those family stories that can be... Um, Biases and myths? <laughs> Both. <laughs> what, what were you getting at? <laughs> so in terms of bias, like, um, you know, I mentioned that my mom is way more interested in her dad's oh. side of the family than my mom's, than her mom's side of the family. Uh -huh. And so I've got a lot of information on him. And so when I do discover some of these things about my my grandmother and, and her family, it's very exciting to me because I didn't grow up around that. Um, and then on my dad's... We didn't, we didn't talk yeah. about genealogy in my family I, I yeah. learned everything I know as an adult mm -hmm. and my my dad's family was very interested in genealogy because of our background I'm actually 13th generation New Mexican and so we came with the conquistadors and that can be a problem as well because they're very excited about the purity of the bloodline that is not <laughs> several of the generations we know it's not slave owners i know conquistadors and slave owners what are you going to do you acknowledge it and you do your best to not continue that that um tradition but it's not really scary it's just fact it's yeah it's just fact it's i mean th that was, was not happy to find in my history but really if you if your family's lived in the united states long enough and you go yeah. back far enough on one of your branches you're going to find it Exactly. And it's um, not that, something else. <laughs> and I find it more interesting to figure out how people went through that, like how that experience changed them and, and made them better people or worse people after the fact, um, I think is much more relevant than the fact that they were or weren't. And I, I, think, have, an I have an example of a will yeah. where, where an ancestor left slaves to his son to, as property you know, mm -hmm. and without names, and mm -hmm. his son, his son left the slaves to his wife. Um, I mean, this is just an incremental improvement. Left them um, as little family groups by name. His yeah. wife and his children. Everybody got like a little group mm -hmm. that that was very specific, and were and were grouped together on purpose and were named. So let's. I mean, that's just a tiny example mm -hmm. of what you're saying of, of of seeing how things progress yeah no i love that example because it's way more complicated than slaves and masters so there was so many interconnected family situations with that that um i think it's important to to have both like what was what was the the story about that and did it turn out to be true or what was the nugget that got morphed into that story um, or is there still a piece that's missing? That's cool. I love helping solve family mysteries. <laughs> right. <laughs> and dispelling family myths, if that's how it turns out with the research. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, you know, the other thing is Hazel helped my mom do some research on on her dad's side of the family to, to fill out some citizenship papers. And um, we, we had the story that my grandmother and grandfather, or great grandmother and grandfather had met on the boat and potentially gotten married on the boat and that was quickly dispelled <laughs> that they were on the same boat but they didn't get married till afterwards or or whatever it ended up being <laughs> and, I, and i and i'm not and i'm not influenced i mean i'm influenced yeah. by the stories but i can only go where the documents lead me <laughs> right um so i think my mom is still having a little bit of a hard time wrapping her head around that one but <laughs> we'll talk 
<laughs> more about how to design your family's legacy um, when we come back from the break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network, and we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. And I'm here with Hazel Thornton, and we are talking about her book. It, you have the longest titles on your books. It's always hard for me to remember them without looking at them. What's a photo without a story? How to create your family legacy. It's a great book. I read the whole thing cover to cover. Yay. <laughs> and, um, what, um, what's interesting is there's a whole chapter in there about downsizing itself, which I think is what most people got into during COVID. Um, but what do you think is so important about the downsizing aspect to creating the family legacy? Well, um, a lot of people, when I say what's a legacy, they they talk about, <clears throat> they, they think of money. They mm -hmm. think of money, they think of, you know, being yeah. important, and leaving, you know, um, buildings with their names on them and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but a legacy can be anything. It can be anything that you leave to anyone, including warm memories of yourself. Mm -hmm. And it can also be uh, clutter. You know, you, mm -hmm. you can leave a big pile of clutter that nobody knows what to do with, and that's your legacy. <laughs> and if you don't want that to be see, then I'm recommending, um, it's, it's the whole Swedish death cleaning concept, mm -hmm. which I was talking about years before I read the book about Swedish death cleaning. So and many of these concepts us organizers have been talking about for years, and then someone finally writes a book with a but, catchy title. But I love it. I love the book, and I <laughs> yeah. love the concept because, you know, what, you could die at any moment. People talk up, think about, well, I will because I'm not going to die yet. Well, you don't know when you're going to die. It, you could be hit by a bus any any time. And right. if, you, if you look around your house and think, well, nobody's going to know what to do with those papers over there, well, then why don't you maybe organize them and, you know, declutter a little bit. And so leave that, some instructions. <laughs> and leave, exactly. <laughs> leave some instructions. And mm -hmm. and to the extent that you can uh, tell stories about those mm -hmm. and leave some instructions about, you know, where your genealogy research is on your computer and go through your memorabilia and, and make mm -hmm. notes about what's important and what's not, you know, like if this is... Mm -hmm. If this is my favorite mug, you know, I could tell a story about it. This is this gets into telling the stories of your things too. Right. If I told a story, this is not. I mean, I love this mug, but um, there's not. It was a gift. But um, but if it was if it was made by my great grandfather and nobody knew it, then it'd be a good thing to tell a story about so that they could tell it from the 20 other mugs I have, which are not meaningful to me. Right. And it would help. It will help them if you haven't actually decluttered then it will help them do it while you're gone. So mm -hmm. it's all about making decisions now so your loved ones don't have to later. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and it is interesting because as an organizer, it's hard sometimes when people want to hold on to especially some of the memorabilia or sentimental things, even when they know that it's not that important. And it's not, we don't make them get rid of anything. Like if there's a bundle of cards from colleagues or something that mean something to them now, but won't mean anything to others later. They just need to designate that that's the fact. Yeah, just just like, either either make a list and include, you know, cards, ditch, you know, that means nothing to me. I mean, to anybody yeah. else but me or put a note on it that says, you can toss this, you know, I'm keeping it, but you can toss it. <laughs> right. Or, you know, some sort of box that's labeled Important to me and me alone. Put in uh, trash immediately. <laughs> uh, it just make it so much easier. Yeah. And, and some people, when they think of downsizing, they think of uh, moving from a large house to a small apartment. And that, that, is, that can be downsizing, and you have to get rid of stuff in order to do that. But you yeah. don't have to be moving to downsize your possessions or to tell the story of your things. Yeah, and that's a good point. I currently have a client that is moving to um, a retirement community thing, aging community. I don't even know what. It, there's so many different ones these days. <laughs> um, and they did the decluttering themselves because they really thought that they needed to make the decisions. And I'm not that much left the house. <laughs> so 
So I'm not really sure how they're going to fit it, but like, that's another one of those areas. Like you got to consider the space to are doing that move. But if you're staying in place, it just helps you not have to work as hard in the place you're currently at while you're aging. You don't have to dust as many things or move not as, as many, many things. things. Not as many things to trip over. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's safety and energy and or, effort. Or take care of or lift or move or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny too. Yesterday I had a client that's like 85 and she takes care of her. She's been her disabled husband for years. And I went to take a box of magazines to the recycle bin for her. And she's like, Oh no, I got it. And she like bends over, picks it up and like lifts it. And I'm like, I think you're my only client over 70. That's like, I don't need help lifting. <laughs> I'm not 70. And I, well, I, 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 I yeah, things, things change. <laughs> yeah. So, but at the same time, she has started decluttering. It's safer for them as they continue to age, but it's interesting. Like, there's so many little aspects and all the delayed decisions of all that stuff you put aside for later, people. Time to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And your kids don't want your stuff. I mean, there's, no. there's some kids who want some stuff, but for the most part, the things that you're saving for your kids, ask them if they want it, if they're old enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but don't just save it because you think because you just assume they're going to want it. I know. And if they say they want it, if they're adults and they have places of their own and they say they want it. Give Make them come get it. Make them come get it. Yes. Don't store it. You can do you can do some what you want to with that space. Yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer that abandoned items are the homeowners to do with what they want. But <laughs> that's controversial in some circles. Um. <laughs> I, I, I tell I tell my clients, you know, tell them tell them your professional organizer says you have to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, because I mean. I don't know. I, I, not, I know not, you do too. Not that they have to get rid of it, but if they want to use me as an excuse, they can. <laughs> yeah, we'll take the blame. We'll do yeah. it. We give the permission. We'll take the blame. It's right. fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what do you have any, um, quick tips about downsizing, especially the memorabilia? Do you have any thoughts of how to help people make the decisions? It's it's just like anything else. If you, if you, if you, if this is a piece of what you think is important paper, mm -hmm. but you don't know what to do with it, you know, start, start sorting it. And, mm -hmm. it, and you sort it into categories like, you know, categories of paper mm -hmm. that, and as you're sorting, you will find out how much in each category you've got. And right. if you realize, oh, I've got five copies of this and I only need one, then right there, you can get rid of four of them. And, and as, so it's a process as you go along you can get rid of more as you see how much you've got and as you realize how little some of it means to you. Right. Um, I love that aspect of categorizing to um, eliminate the excess. So we'll, we'll talk more about um, that piece when we come back. We've got to take another break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network, and I'm here with Hazel Thornton. And we will uh, pick up about how to, to use categories to eliminate some of the excess stuff as you downsize. We'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. Hazel and I were just talking about how you can use the process of categorizing for photos, correspondence, papers, things uh, into some broad categories that can help you start whittling down the excess of stuff or any kind of duplicates and things. But some people have a hard time with categories. So Hazel, do you have any suggestions of, of some starting point categories to, to do the first sort? Yes, almost everybody has photos. So mm -hmm. you have, you know, a spray or a box to, to put photos in as you find them and label it photos, then you'll know that those are all photos. Mm -hmm. And you have another sorting tray or box that you can put vital documents into, you know, important, mm -hmm. important papers. Um, another one could contain letters as you find them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those are some pretty basic categories. If you come up with um, other categories, that's fine. And then you might realize you need to combine them or separate them out. And this is sometimes where people, some people can do this on their own 
Mm-hmm. And other people need to hire a professional organizer to help them to do this. Yeah, it turns out there's a lot of um, how our brains process information. There's some categories of how our brains process. And some people just struggle with the the ability to um, categorize things. Exploding a situation and then reeling it back in is what we're talking about. Um, and some people get really bogged down in the details. And some people can make the categories no problem, but they can't do the next step. So get some help if you need it. Um, do some research, read some articles, read a book, maybe. <laughs> and, and, don't, and don't expect to do this project in a weekend. Uh, in oh, my, no, it's a long time. In my book, I talk about, you know, make this your new hobby. Do it at your own pace. It's enjoyable. Don't make it, mm-hmm. you know, the more, the more, the scarier it seems and the harder it seems, the less you're going to want to do it. Yeah. But, but if you take your time with it, it might even be fun. Right. So that brings me to the photo on the cover of your book which is fabulous. Do you have a copy that you can hold I up? Do. I just realized. Can, can you see? Oh, uh, uh, hang on. Yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> oh, blurry, isn't it? It's because you have the filter on, um, I don't so have it doesn't filter. read it. I don't have a filter on. You have the background blurred though, right? Do I? Yeah. Well, anyway. It's, it's okay. My, but it's, there's it's a, a lady in a swimsuit <laughs> in front of a fancy building on a beach. I have, I have it's, I call her bathing beauty, and she's my... Mm-hmm. She's my uh, uh, paternal grandmother, Hazel mm-hmm. Thornton. I'm, you know, she was named yeah. for her. And she, um, and her full name is Hazel Eilery Il- Clay Thornton. Nice. And, and I, it's this, the photo is symbolic of this whole photo journey for me that I think a lot of people can maybe relate to. Mm-hmm. Um, in my case, I never met her because she died when my dad was 16. Mm-hmm. And I also never saw that photo until I was in my 60s. So why? I don't know why. Maybe because it was painful for my dad to talk about. Maybe because it just never occurred to him to say, oh, look, I've got some more photos you've never seen. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it started me on a journey of um, not only getting to know my grandma that I never met, but also there, there's, a, there's a big old hotel in the back of in in the background of the photo that I got curious about and I asked him and he's like I don't know where that was and I asked on Facebook and a lot of people thought it was the Hotel Del Mar in Santa Monica because it looks like it it looks Mm -hmm. pretty much like it and other people and and but but I could see that it wasn't quite it wasn't quite right it wasn't I didn't think it was the Hotel Del Mar but I didn't know where it was so through the combination of you know, looking at census records and maps and articles from the internet and taking clues from other photos. And I'll admit, I also consulted with Maureen Taylor, the the photo detective. (laughs) That's Um, so cool. We we figured out, I figured out with her guidance that it was really the hotel in Long Beach, Mm. which is only important to me, Mm -hmm. but is an example of how other people can do research to figure out what's going on in their family photos. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I, I think that if it's, it's the longest, there are several photo stories in my book, but the book is not about my family per se. It just has some examples of right. what you can do too with your photos. Mm-hmm. And this is the longest one. Most of them are just a paragraph long. Right. And, and I hope that they, inspire people to tell their own photo stories. No, it's cool. And I've actually picked a couple photos um, that I'm going to talk to you about. <laughs> they're, I don't even know if they're people in my family. We found these two photos of people. We have no idea who they are. It, they look cool. They're... <laughs> well, one, thing, one thing that people do is, well, first of all, they get rid of those photos and, and maybe mm-hmm. they're throwing away genealogical clues. But right. they also separate them from the other photos. Mm-hmm. And you can pick up clues from the photos, like if it's in an album, the photos before them, the photos after them. Right. The, the albums provide context. So don't don't separate mystery photos from the other photos. Oh, no, they were just loose and things. But I'll, I'll bring them to lunch and you'll be okay. able to see why I'm, I, I thought they were so funny. Um, uh, but also, I just read an article in the Smithsonian about the people in Columbus, New Mexico, that uh, 
oh, and now I can't remember the guy's name, Sam something, who owned the general store there and was the reason Pancho Villa invaded in 1960, the one and only time the U.S. was actually invaded. Um, and um, she had she has she did a history thing from the photos that a friend took of her grandfather in like the 20s. Um, and she told this brilliant story in the Smithsonian. So it was it was another example of you find family photos and you know part of the story, you don't know the whole story and how are you gonna tell that story? Um, and she made a documentary about her whole process. So it was pretty cool. That, um, is, that is cool. Yeah, so you never know, you just never know. So tell us, um, well, we're gonna have to take one more break, but I wanna know what other resources you might have for for people that are interested in, in learning more about you and your stuff. Okay. Oh, right now? Yeah, just say real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we might not have time, but go ahead. <laughs> you just said we were going to come back, I thought. Um, I so on my website, just go to my website, orgforlife.com. And that's O-R-G number four. L-I-F-E dot yeah. com. Okay. <laughs> We'll sort this out while we're on break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino, the Streamlined Connection <laughs> from Bold Brave TV Network. And um, yeah, after the break, Hazel and I will will wrap up and and show you how this how to live a family legacy ties into the whole Streamlined Connection situation. We'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Links here somewhere. Down there, I think. I'm here with Hazel Thornton of Organized for Life and Beyond, talking about her book, uh, What's a Photo Without a Story and How to Create Your Family Legacy. So what would you like people to know about leaving a family legacy? Like tie it up in a bow. What's the most important thing they can know? Nobody's going to tell your story except for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Your family will thank you if you put some effort into telling the stories of your photos and your family and your things. If you do nothing else, um, buy a copy of my book for the photo, the, for the family history keeper in your family, if it's not you. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there are a lot of sources on my website, mm -hmm. which is orgforlife.com, O-R-G number four, L-I-F-E.com. <clears throat> and um, the, the resources, for example, are, um, well, my book, <clears throat> but also I have what I call resource roundups, which mm -hmm. I have one specific to genealogy or a legacy resource roundup and a, and a uh, photo and memorabilia resource. Roundup. So there's free, both free and paid resources on my website, plus mm -hmm. my blog, plus my newsletter, plus social right. media. And I will say those roundups are a goldmine for people that are looking for um, inspiration to start and and the how to step by step stuff they're really handy. There there, um, there are resources in the book of course, but yeah. things change. So I'm keeping the resources on my website mm -hmm. uh, up to date even if things change from the book. Yeah, I love that. Okay, well thank you Hazel for being here. I want thanks for to having you. Just fun. yeah, um, I want to let everybody know that. The reason legacy can be so important to the Streamline Connection, and I hope you noticed, was how many times we talked about the mindset piece of it. What is it you want? What is your story? Why is it important to you? Why have you put it off? What do you want instead? All those things are the mindset piece. The categorize, categorizing and sorting is the organizing piece, and the telling the story is the fun what you might want to do piece and so it connects to everything and the same approach can work for your business as well if you have a story to tell about a business you started or the work you did on a special project it can go through the same process legacy process um i'm really excited that we were able to do this show today because it's uh becoming more and more of a hobby for me as well i'm really finding it fascinating um I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino, and you can get more of my stuff and my um, resources at morethanorganized.net. Tell all your friends. It's always more fun to get organized together. And in the meantime, have a delightful day.